Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study once again tonight. We bless your name for your children, brothers and sisters who are coming regularly. And thank you for how you are revealing yourself to them, the deep truths of the Word of God. We pray, Lord, that you help those who have not been coming, that you stir them up so that they will come and join us and they will not be missing the deep revelations of your Word. In Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that for those of us who are here together to study your word, that this word will be of benefit to every one of us in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind and your truth to us by your spirit, so that in times of trial, in times of persecution, in times of conflict and pressure, your word will be a strength within us and will be able to stand in spite of everything around in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding tonight that we may behold deep, wondrous things out of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study once again tonight. I appreciate those of you who are here. And I want to encourage you that you also to your friends, brothers and sisters, children of God, that you need to represent with us so that these deep revelations of the word of God you will not be missing it so regularly. We're seeing in Revelation chapter 1. We've been looking at the revelation that God gave unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was symbolized and signified by an angel unto John the Beloved. We read in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him. To show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass. And it, shot, and it signified and sent it by an his angel unto his servant John. You will see that it's coming from God above. And then it was given to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it was revealed through the angel and given to John. But we are told in that verse 1 that it is to be revealed and shown unto his servants. His servants of that time. His servants of the time to come. His servants and children and ministers of the gospel until the end of the age. And eventually it tells us that it was John that bore record in verse 2 of this word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. You'll see here he combines the whole Bible. It says, number one, there is the word of God. That's the Old Testament. And there is the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is the New Testament. And actually as he bore witness, he was bearing witness by writing. And was bearing witness by preaching. If you, you know your Bible, there is a gospel according to St. John. Then there is first John, second John, and third John. In that, he was bearing record. And you will see that he mentions being a witness in the gospel according to St. John. And also in first John, he mentions being a witness. In fact, he said, he's bearing record. And then he tells us in verse 3, blessed is he that read it. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep this things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Already he tells us that these things must surely come to pass, which means then the fulfillment is at the door. But please remember, a thousand years is with the Lord like a day, and a day like a thousand years. So uh, you shouldn't wonder then that two thousand years have passed, and these things have not been fulfilled yet in their completion, because the two thousand years will just be like two days unto the Lord. And then he said it's John in verse 4, to the seven churches which are in Asia. I've already told you in the studies we have heard, there were more than seven churches in Asia Minor. But the Lord chose seven, because seven is the number for perfection, fullness, and completeness. And so, the Lord was actually writing to all the churches. You see it already in verse 1. It's to reveal to his servants. And then you see the message to each of the churches, whether it's Ephesus or Smyrna, or it's Pagamos or Thyatira, or it's Sardis or it's Philadelphia, or it's Laodicea. It says at the end of each message, it says, What the Spirit says on the churches, let him that has an ear, let him hear. So then the message is not just for those seven churches, it's for the whole church. In the whole generation, until Christ will come. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you, and peace from him, which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. 
and from Jesus Christ, who is the people witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and he has made us kings and peace unto God and his Father, to him the glory and dominion forever and ever. And everybody said, Behold, he cometh with a cloud, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all the kindred of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen, and Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Having covered all those eight verses, we're not going into the vision itself, the vision of a glorified Christ. As you look at this vision of a glorified Christ, you start from verse 9. First of all, John introduces himself. He says, I, John, I, John, one of the twelve apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, John, that he is one of the people in the inner circle of the disciples of Jesus, when Jesus was there on earth. I, John, yes, that St. John, that went to the Mount of Transfiguration, was the Lord Jesus Christ, as Jesus was going to that mountain, he took Peter, James, and John. Yes, it's I, John, is the one that leaned on the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I, John, if I will that you tarry until I come, what is that to be Peter? You just follow me. Here is the person that the Lord said before he dies. He will see the glory of the coming Christ. He will see the vision of the glorified Christ. He will see Christ reigning. And he will see the picture. He will see the theme. He will see the whole scene before he even comes to fulfillment. And he says to say, John, according to the promise of the Lord, that is writing this to you. But there's another thing here. I, John, I remember we went to the Lord Jesus Christ with mother. And then we said, can we see it? One on this side and one on the other side. And then Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. Will you be able to drink of the cup I drink? And will you be baptized and immersed in the suffering? I shall be immersed in as I baptize with. And I remember that James and I, my brother and I, we said, yes, we can. And he said, yes, you will. You will suffer persecution, untold persecution. But it is not for me to give that seed to you. It is for whom it is appointed. And as a remembers that the persecution he was going through now, and the deprivation he was going through now, and the banishment to the Isle of Patmos he was going through now, he said, it's me, it's me, it's exactly as the Lord has promised, I, John, who am also your brother and companion, and companion in tribulation, in persecution, in suffering, in the pressure, the oppression that came, the affliction that came, as a result of the fact that they were believing the Lord, and in the kingdom, and patience of Jesus Christ. He was in the isle called Patmos, that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's why I read to you from verse 1 to verse 8. It's referring to the record he had born in verse 2, who bear record of the word of God, part 1. And then of the testimony of Jesus Christ, part 2. He said, I've been bearing record, I've been bearing witness, I've been preaching the word, and I've been revealing to the people around, and to believers and unbelievers alike, the word of the Lord. He said, because of that. I'm suffering persecution, and I'm not the only one. You too, you are suffering persecution. I'm a companion with you in tribulation, and it's for the kingdom of God, and it's for the patience of Jesus Christ. And I'm in this isle, in this island of Patmos, just because of this word of God I bear record to. And before, because of the testimony of Jesus Christ, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Sunday came. And I remember, were it not for the persecution now, I will be in the house of the Lord. But that will not hinder me. I was still in the spirit of the Lord on the Lord's day, on that day of worship. And then I had behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Tatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And before we actually see what he saw, let us look at this story today, the great persecution that came before the great revelation. The great persecution that preceded the great revelation. As you have seen, John has introduced himself. 
not only introduce himself, he introduced the circumstances preceding the vision and the revelation that he received. This John is that same disciple whom Jesus loved. He loved Jesus because Jesus loved him. And he said it already in the earlier verse, in one of the earlier verses, when he said, Unto him that loved us. And because he loved us, he washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us now sing some peace unto him and unto the Father. And then he says, because of that, glory be unto him. I want my life to be glorifying unto him. And I want to love him. He, he loved him many years before. He had been following the Lord now for more than 60 years. History tells us that he became a believer about the age of 25. And right now, he must be around 90 years of age. More than 65 years he had been following the Lord. And he was still loving the Lord steadfastly without compromising. At this time, it was uh, a Domitian that was uh, the Caesar, and that is the ruler, the emperor. If you understand the history of those people, General Titus was the one that destroyed Jerusalem, 70 AD. And John was alive at that time. Now General Titus had died. And he brought that to General Titus as Domitian. He had become the emperor and the ruler. And he was a very wicked person. Not only wicked, very notorious. And not only notorious, he was very proud. He wanted his image in every major city. And then he was the first emperor that said he shouldn't just call him Caesar of Rome. They shouldn't call him emperor. They should call him Lord and God. So the people will go before the image of the mission. And when they will kneel down, they will bend the knee. And they will say, our Lord and our God. But you know the Christians know only one God. The God of heaven. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And they refuse to bend the knee. That infuriated, that made him bitter and angry. And the persecution became very intense. The people that loved the Lord and that loved Jesus Christ supremely and followed him infinitely, like John the Beloved, they refused to bow the knee to any other, to any other God or to the image of the mission. That's the reason the persecution was so intense. And the persecution they gave them, and sometimes they beat them, sometimes they give them real hard, serious work to do. And you can imagine a man at the age of 90, suffering such a great persecution. This was the last surviving apostle. That is, all the other apostles had died. His colleagues, the people of his age, the people that knew the Lord at the same time, that knew the Lord, they had all died. And this man remained alone. And even though he was alone, without any support, without any encouragement, without anybody to hold his hand, and so, and let us keep on standing. He was still standing all alone. I uh, was told that he was uh, uh, the, uh, the pastor, the bishop of the, of the church in Ephesus. By the time they were arrested, the church was teaching the people to keep firm and compromising to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was banished under the reign of this wicked emperor, the mission. But most of all, he was banished too, was a barren, rocky little island, about 40 miles off the coast of Asia Minor. Punishment is such a remote island as a form of human punishment. The Christians were treated like criminals because they refused to worship the emperor as their God, as their Lord. And being a leader of these of this Christians, that was enough. The criminal attempts to end the John. Very severe persecution. Such punishment was generally preceded by scourging, by serious wicked cruel beating, marked by perpetual status. Twenty clothing, insufficient food, and sleep from their ground with dark prison and work under the lash of someone appointed by the persecutors. Suffering God did persecution for his Lord. Then he saw a glorious vision, a glorious revelation, the glorious picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at these three verses today, we're considering them under three subtitles. Number one, the persecution of Christians before the revelation. The persecution, not only of John, the persecution of Christians all alike before the revelation. Number two, perception of Christ through the spirit of revelation. Just seeing Christ through the spirit of revelation. Now, number three, the preeminence of Christ in the revelation. Let's come back to point one. The persecution of Christians before the revelation. In Revelation chapter one, let's look at it again in verse nine. I, John. It's like, uh, I'm surprised. I, John. In the Patmos of all places, seeing this revelation, I, John, 
All those of you in the city and there is easy life and you have not gone through persecution yet and you think that those of us under persecution, we are at a disadvantage. Listen to this. I, John, who also am your companion, am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle, in the island that is called Patmos for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. As we look at what John is saying, he mentions three things here about himself and about his fellow Christians. It's not only talking about himself because he talks about himself as a companion in tribulation, in trial, in suffering, in persecution, together with all the other people. He said there are three things here. Now, number one, your brother and your companion in tribulation. That is in persecution. Number two, your brother, your companion in the kingdom of God. He's been born again. Not only born again, sanctified and purified by the blood of the Lamb. And then filled with the Holy Ghost. He was there on the day of Pentecost. And then he was one of the people that preached and proclaimed the kingdom of God. And therefore he saw himself as a partaker of that kingdom. Not only a partaker of that kingdom, a companion, a fellow uh, companion of the other people too, the other believers too, in the kingdom of God. Number three, a companion in the patience of Jesus Christ. In the patience, a perseverance of Jesus Christ. That is, whatever Jesus leads us, whatever Jesus permits, patiently, perseveringly, we go through it. And that is a commonality. That is a common thing among all those believers there. The Christians who are being severely persecuted. And the Christian leaders in particular, they receive greater pressure from the persecutors. But you see at this time now, how you receive this revelation. As you look at uh, the records of the Bible, from the beginning of the Bible, it's encouraging to learn that persecution of physical suffering does not hinder God's revelation to his faithful children. Ask your fellow brother, ask your fellow sister, when they were going through persecution, was the time the Bible became very real to them. The revelation of the Word of God, the insight, the wisdom, the depth of knowledge they received during the time of persecution was so great. Ask that sister there, whose husband had been, you know, fiery and furious at home, and the persecution is so intense. It's at the time of that persecution, if you ask that sister, that she received great revelation in the Word of God. Ask the brother there, when that brother was going through real torture, real pressure, real persecution. It was at that time the Bible was sweet and the revelation was so deep and the glory of the Lord was so much upon his life. And if you ask yourself after you've gone through that persecution at that time your prayer life was deepened. At that time your understanding of the Bible was very real. At that time the revelation of the word of God. It just opened the Bible like this and revelations will be coming. Interpretation will be coming. There was deep understanding of the word of God during that persecution. No no, persecution doesn't destroy revelation. Persecution doesn't hinder inspiration. Persecution does not hinder, does not limit the understanding of the word of God. On the other hand, it is persecution, it is suffering, it is the pressure, it is all the things coming upon us from the world that actually drives us nearer and nearer unto the Lord. Persecution and after trouble do not necessarily hinder spiritual fellowship or spiritual growth. If you think about Moses, he wrote the Pentateuch, that is Genesis to Deuteronomy, in the wilderness while he was enduring the heavy burden of leading the rebellious Israelites. And you think about David. David was inspired to write this many psalms while he was being persecuted. He was running away from Saul. You think about Isaiah that saw the revelation of the Lord that spoke so much about Christ, about the coming Messiah. That Isaiah received his prophecies concerning Christ amidst troubles and persecution. Think about Ezekiel. Ezekiel was shown the visions that he wrote in his book while he was in exile. And of course, Jeremiah. He wrote that book under trials and deprivations that were almost unbearable. And Paul the Apostle, we are told, wrote his epistles, first and second epistles of Peter, just before he was crucified. We have all learned about Paul the Apostle, the revelations there, the mystery of the kingdom that, is, that are written in the epistles of Paul. He got them while he was suffering persecution in loneliness, in the loneliness of the prison. If you have uh, come across the book, uh, the Pilgrim's Progress by John Boyan. John Boyan was a Baptist patron, but then he was a non-conformist. He will not compromise on what he knew. 
uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the word of the Lord. And because of that, he was still in, in the prison. He spent all together 12 years in the prison, in the Bedford jail. But you see next to the Bible, the most loved and the most read book is the Pilgrim Progress. It is a vision of the revelation of the triumph of the Christian pilgrim in his journey from this world to the world that is to come. And you see that uh, John Boyan wrote, he received and wrote that revelation of the pagan's progress while he was suffering imprisonment in that bed for jail. And there were needs in his life. In fact, if you read the history of the life of that man, real, real suffering. And yet, next to the Bible, the pagan's progress is a bestseller. Next to the Bible. You think about that. That means then that there is persecution. That doesn't stop the revelation of God in your life or in my life. Just remain with the Lord, you'll find that that suffering, that persecution will deepen your Christian life. As we think about John again, we're going back to John the Beloved, and we'll see him on the Isle of the Patmos. He patiently endured the punishment for his loyalty to his king and his faithfulness to the word of God and the word of Christ. Yet, the loss of the wicked only brought John nearer to God and the Patmos of persecution, persecuting Rome, suddenly became the door to the most sublime, the most majestic, and the most glorious communion any man ever had with heaven. That's often God's way. We gain the greatest knowledge of God through the deepest suffering. Let's go back to that uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 9 again. It says in verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother, and companion in tribulation. Stop there for a moment. And uh, let us see this John in John in uh, Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10, reading from verse 8. Revelation 10, verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hands of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. This is John again. You see the personal pronoun, I, I, I. It's me. It's me, John. I got this revelation from the Lord, and the book had been written. The revelation you find in that book. And then I got it from that angel, and I ate it up. And it says, and it said unto me, take it, and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be, it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey. What he's saying is, as you see it, you'll be enjoying it. As you see it, it will be wonderful to you. Even the privilege, the mystery that the Lord is revealing to you, the joy of it, the sweetness of it, the happiness that the Lord can choose you to be the one that will put this on record. But as we look at the content of the things that will happen, the thunders and the devastations and the horrors and the death. And the coins of the people, and the sorrow of the people, crying that the rocks will fall upon them. Then you understand, the content is bitter. But the very fact that you are chosen to be the writer, that will be sweet, that will make you happy. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. It's still telling us that you see John, that is writing. But it's telling us that he's a companion of the brethren in tribulation. John, are you surprised? Are you bothered that now you are suffering persecution for the Lord Jesus Christ? John says, no, I'm not bothered. Go back to my gospel and you will see the prediction that persecution will come upon the believers. I've written that already a few years ago, out of the words of Jesus Christ. And I know that heaven and earth may pass away, but the words of Jesus Christ will never go unfulfilled in John chapter 16. Verse 33, John chapter 16, verse 33. Here are the words of Jesus Christ telling his own disciples before he left that persecution was coming. Get ready. Persecution will be coming. Get ready. Get prepared. In John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, These, it says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace in the world ye shall have tribulation. John wasn't surprised. He had written about that many some years before. He said, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That was the thing that gave them the assurance that although there will be persecution, although there will be pressure, although there will be all that physical suffering, yet we can still be of good cheer. We can still be happy in the Lord. 
what Paul the Apostle came, and then he took this to have been planted. He gave encouragement to the people that persecution will come, tribulation and trials will come. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 14, Acts chapter 14, reading from verse 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, and I thought many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, we must, we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Don't be surprised then, if you are born again, and then you have entered into the kingdom of God in the spiritual realm of the kingdom. But then the final kingdom that is still to come, you are preparing so that you will enter into that kingdom to understand we must, through much tribulation, as one is going, another one is coming. Because sinners are still in the world, and there the people that persecute. Because Satan is still in the world, and he is the agent and the very source and the origin of the persecution. Because evil spirits that lead people to do evil, they still much around here in the world. And they are the people, they are the spirit that instigate people, move people, uh, stir up people, to persecute the believers. Because the people that love darkness rather than light, they are still in the world. And they are the people that will move others, they will motivate others, they will stir up other people to persecute the people that love the light and have gone out of darkness. If you have come into the light, if you have received the light of the gospel and you are walking according to the word of God, the people of this world, those who are still in darkness, they are going to persecute you because you are walking in the light. But then it says that persecution is not something to do in our lives because maybe you are wondering yourself and you say, ah, but why should God allow the persecution? Why doesn't God just take the persecution away because the persecution has a purpose. Because the persecution is like the exercise that the little children have. If those uh, little children, if they don't have the exercise, their muscles will not be strengthened, their bones will not be strong, and their intelligence will not be developed. It is the exercise and all the things that come to them. That's the thing that's strengthening them. Look at those trees that you see on the side of the road. The wind will blow. They will bend this way and bend that way and then the sun will shine and the sun will come upon them. It is a storm and the wind that strengthens those trees and the roots go deep into the ground. It is a persecution. It is a trial. It is a suffering that makes the Christian strong and it makes your roots to go deep into Christ so that you are rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. There is a purpose, there is a reason why those persecutions are allowed. In Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 1, it says, Therefore, be justified by faith, we have peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation. We don't regret, we glory in tribulation. We don't murmur, we glory, we rejoice in tribulation. Why so? Why do we rejoice in tribulation? Because we know that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is set abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. That is, in the midst of that tribulation, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that problem, we keep on rejoicing because it produces something good, something marvelous in our Christian life. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we are reading from verse 8, like that no man shall be moved by these afflictions. So you yourself know that we are appointed there unto that you want the Lord appointed our lives and appointed our Christian living and appointed the promises of God and appointed the ministry we are going to be involved with, you also appointed the suffering, you also appointed the tribulation, you also appointed the persecution and you moderate everything, you limit everything, you doesn't allow any persecution, any suffering to go beyond what you have appointed, we are appointed there unto for barely when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it is it came to pass, and you know for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by from me the enemy, the tempter, attempted 
were appointed you and I labored be in vain. He said, Let you become you begin to come to your own conclusion that if our leaders are suffering like that, if the apostles are suffering like that, if they are suffering persecution and tribulation, maybe something is wrong in their life. No, the opposite is true. Because they are right for the Lord, because they are taking the ministry appointed unto them by the Lord. So the suffering appointed was that ministry is being fulfilled also in their lives. In Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, we're looking at verse twelve. It says in Second Timothy chapter three, verse twelve, giving us the assurance that this tribulation is not peculiar to John. And it's not peculiar to the Christians of the first century. And it's not peculiar to Paul the Apostle. He tells us, he says, you, yes, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Everyone that will suffer and that will live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. The only way you can avoid the persecution is if you avoid godliness. If you avoid holiness. If you avoid taking his time. If you avoid uh, taking an uncompromising stand, that's the only time you can avoid persecution. And if you avoid holiness, you avoid heaven. If you avoid godliness, you avoid heaven. Therefore, just stay there and understand that it is appointed. But nothing will come on you much more than what the Lord has appointed. It says the reason for that persecution is in verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. Eh, they are deceived. Some of them even think that they are serving God by persecuting you. They belong to the wrong religion, but they think they are right and they think they are going well. And there is no salvation being taught in their local assembly, in their churches where they go, and they feel that they are the only people of God. And when you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you are living a righteous life, a godly life, those people that have, de- have deceived themselves and others are still deceiving them, they will persecute you, thinking that. You are wrong and thinking that they are right. But it says in that persecution, there's something you have to do. It's in verse 14. It says, But continue, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It says, Don't look at the persecution, don't look at the problem, just continue in the things that you have learned. And as he said that to uh, Timothy, he made himself an example. Look at Second Timothy chapter two verse nine, wherein I suffer trouble. He said, Timothy, what I'm telling you to do, I'm doing it also. What I tell you to endure, I'm enduring it too. What I tell you that if you continue, continue in the Lord, even though there's persecution, even though there's suffering, I'm doing it too because it's this wherein I myself I suffer trouble. As an evil doer, even unto bonds into imprisonment, but the word of God is not found. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And then in verse, in verse 11, it says it's a faithful thing. For if we, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him, if we suffer with him. We shall also reign with him if we deny him. He also will deny us. I pray you will not deny the Lord. Whatever comes your way, you keep on standing till the very end in Jesus' name. You remember what, uh, what John has written. John has said there are three things. Number one, is because I'm, I'm your companion in tribulation. Number two, I'm your companion in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom. When he said in the kingdom, what does that mean? And when did he come into that kingdom? And how can you be sure that you yourself, you are in the kingdom also, so that you are the one of those companions that, that uh, John is talking about? It tells us in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us to be me, and me to the partaker of the inheritance of the saints and the light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. How? How was that done? But for sin, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. When you came to the Lord, maybe last year, maybe five years ago, some many years ago, when you came to the Lord and you turned away from your sins and you repeated from your sins and you said, Lord, forgive me, turn me around, change my life. I want to serve you till the rest of my life from now on. And then the Spirit of God bore witness in your heart that your sins were forgiven. That now is giving you a new nature. 
and you are not serving the Lord, and there is no problem, there is, uh, there is no conflict between you and the Lord anymore. That the middle wall of partition that divided you from the Lord has been broken down because you repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ at that time. You were delivered out of the kingdom of darkness, and you were brought into the kingdom of His dear Son. And this kingdom of God is not physical. It's not a meat and drink. It is something spiritual, and it comes with righteousness, purity, holiness in our lives. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is righteousness, and it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Ghost. And then in Revelation here is what it tells us in chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at it now because it says, I'm in this isle of the Patmos, and I'm your companion, number one, I'm your companion in tribulation, number two, I am your companion in the kingdom, in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, number three, I'm your companion in patience, the patience, the perseverance of the Lord Jesus Christ, that means I'm not in a hurry. That means, although the suffering is there, and I'm already 90 years of age, and not to know Jesus, when are you going to come? When will I die? So that I'll escape all these things. I'm patient in the tribulation. I'm persevering in the tribulation. In chapter 3 of Revelation, reading from verse 10 and verse 11, it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which is to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon upon the earth. It says, what we are going through is nothing. When the great tribulation comes, that one is going to try, going to test, and going to really punish all the people of the earth. Therefore, we can go through the little, little things that come across our way now, because we are going to escape the great tribulation that is to come. Behold, I come quickly. Whole past. That which which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. We can stop a little here. So that we we'll reign with the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. In Romans chapter 7, chapter 8, verse 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. And ye children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we stop our sin, that we also may be glorified together. I pray that the grace to remain steadfast and compromising until the Lord comes, He will give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. Because if we stop our sin here, we're going to reign with Him in eternity. Now we go to point number two. Perception of Christ through the spirit of revelation. The perception of Christ through the spirit of Revelation. It tells us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Here John is telling us that even though he was undergoing persecution and even though the, uh, the conditions, uh, the situation was not convenient at all, yet he says, Do you know this? I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. That means the spirit of God took over. How did that happen? Obviously, he was not looking at things that are seen. He was looking at things that are not seen. Actually, he was not thinking of his condition and mourning, and murmuring, and complaining, and saying, Oh God, why has this come upon me? Obviously, he was not regretting that he was a Christian. He was still meditating on the words of the Lord, on the glory that shall come, on all the words that Christ has spoken to some people before. And as well, he was meditating, then it was the day of the Lord. And he said, well, it's the day of the Lord. Even though we cannot have music now, even though I cannot have companions here now, even though I cannot have other worshippers to deal with me now, even though I cannot be on the pulpit, I will preach him now. He started preaching to himself, and he started meditating on the word of God. On the Lord's day, that was a Sunday. Because you see, those early believers, they knew that Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Not only that, he appeared to them many times by many infallible proofs on the first day of the week. And then because of that, the first day of the week, the church will gather together to commemorate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and to commemorate the redemption, the recreation of the new creature that we have. And because of that, he had become so used to that, that even though he was in the Isle of Patmos, isolated from every other Christian around, he was still in the spirit, in the spirit of worship in the spirit of the Lord, on the Lord's day. And while he was in the spirit, he had the voice behind him. And what does that mean in the spirit? In the spirit. It means that the spirit of God took over his life. 
overpowered the flesh, overpowered the physical surrounding, and he just found himself open to only the things of the Spirit of God. That was not the only time he will be in the Spirit. If you look at Revelation chapter 4,
for your job to do that. What a wonderful thing. If you don't look at things that are saying, but you look at things that are not saying. What a wonderful thing. You come to the house of the Lord and the Lord says, and you feel yourself, you will have just yourself, so that you can be in the spirit. And the things of this Lord, the mandation of God, will you not be taking your attention while you are in the presence of the Lord. It is saying that God will reveal to you how you feel, how the spirit has us all to you, the good things of God, the Lord man, not the things of the man, but God for the things of man, which is in you, you will show the things of God, not the man, for the things of God, not me, for the things of the things of the man, for the things of the things of God, that we may know the things which are the particular duty to God, are God. And he tells us in that chapter of the also, the truth, not in the world with man's wisdom teacher, but in which the holy just teacher compares to each other to the teacher of the most holy. He does not assume that the spirit of God, but it is the time to call to others in the most holy. And we are also sitting in the next round of the physical, and we are not seeing ourselves to hear the voice of the Lord. And we are not in the spirit, even though we are in the house of God, even though it is the last thing. So we are not in the spirit, the spirit of the spirit, for the Holy Spirit is in the Lord, and He knows and the past the spiritually discerned. And the first thing for the Lord, that is the last thing. So we are seeing that I'm saying in love with the Lord, the first thing. We start to ask for the purpose of the church. Ask for the church, we need to start to do it. We have a church, we need to start to do it. We have a church, we need to start to do it. The rest of the church, we need to start to do it. We have a church, we need to start to do it. The last thing, ask for the church, we need to start to do it. And for the first thing, we need to start to do it. The last thing. Now, the disciples came to them to do it by the third church. And to them, we are ready to depart on the morrow. And we continue to speak until midnight. Did you hear that? I said, Did you hear that? We continue to speak until until they tell that they are going to do it on midnight. We never listen to the one, never listen to the one, and we need to continue from that time. Never listen to the one, but tell me. So John is a little bit of spirit, and he says, I was in the spirit, and the Lord said, I have to hold you a great time out of the compass. I have to hold you a great time. And that great time that I make the compass, that's the voice of the Almighty. The voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. The voice of Alpha and Omega. The voice of the one that was born and is risen to the and is alive forevermore. And his voice was not loud when he was walking the streets of Jericho, when he was in Jerusalem in his earthly ministry. His voice was not pardoning a God of his temple. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, after Jerusalem I knew, and before the door was opened in heaven, and the first voice you shall have was a sweet one in his temple. A sweet one in his temple. A sweet one in his temple. Chapter 2, it says, Come up to me there, and I will show thee things which must be here after. As you look at John chapter 11, you perceive the things of the Spirit of God, as well as the Spirit of the Lord's Day. The Spirit of the Spirit of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of the Spirit of the Spirit of God. They are the little things that do on the land, but we pursue it, they also pursue it, that the beginning of the good revelation, all go to the end of the millennial kingdom, all that was revealed to him while there was in the spirit of the Lord's day. So, they are commanded to arise from the revelation, and to send it to the seven churches in Israel now. But we have understood now that persecution, the pain, the suffering, the hardship, we are not in that, we are not in that. Is God a good minister? Or sometimes I can believe him. And then there's persecution. And maybe there is still. Then we are wondering, this persecution was our first minister. Or this strong minister. No, it never happens like that. No matter where a man is. No matter how hard his life may be. And no matter what he's passing through. He may be, he may still be in this field. Then he ever gives himself to the Lord and to take himself to the And to the Lord, he is still in the spirit, even. But let's explain. In the midst of the fire, we are coming to you. We are coming to you to all the people. Now I want to see something in the fire. The preeminence of Christ. The preeminence of Christ is the other one. 
the new meeting, King of Kings, we met at last, as a place along with us too. And the listeners as a place along with us too. And it's called unto me, it is done, and all that, and from the other beginning, and then I will do the thing, that the source of the tension of the work of life, came as you are new part of the book of Revelation, you find that Jesus Christ, he called the Father, the soul of the Father, the Jesus, and in the same nature, in the presence of the Father, in the presence of the Father, in the sound of the Father, and the eternal, the eternal existence of the Father, the profound control of the first and the last, the beginning and the end of Revelation, the Revelation of the Holy Spirit, leading from the soul. The first to hold our conversation, this is Jesus Christ. And my reward is with me to be that man and call him as his work shall be. And I'm asking, and the only one, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is the Lord Jesus Christ is here for our devotion. But to see how Jesus has told me to enter the church of God. And to you be seen from the Christians. And the need to rest from the Buddha, the bride, and the man of God. As you look at the revelation of the Lord, you see what the Lord is commanding James in verse 11. He says that the end of the heaven says, and the answer, and the only God, the first and the last, what I see is right in the book. And so James has a recording that he put on issue of the episode from the plan, and in the Pagano, and in the Pagano, and in the Pagano, and in the Pagano, and in the Pagano. If you look at the scene, you will see that scene from which you will see a rise. Rise, the scene, is by a scene, as the end. And the scene is not the end, that's the scene. And the scene is by the scene, the rise, that is the scene. The scene is the scene now, the vision of Jesus Christ. And the scene is the end, all the conditions of the second person of this time. And the scene is the scene, after the God has been rested away. And the great liberation will be on the earth, rise, and the scene. Chapter 14 of Revelation, the commandments of the Lord to join again. Chapter 14 of Revelation, reading from the 13. The first one I had a bird from heaven saying unto me, Wow, so what have I said? We start in the Lord. From things first, you, first the Lord, that the new world from their neighbor, and their work with their neighbor. My look, and behold, the last cry. And I climbed the fire, one step, right into the stone of me, hopping on his head, the golden king, and in his right hand, the sharp scissors. There was a light of the kingdom, for the encouragement of the believers, for the encouragement of the believers that are suffering from the kingdom, right of the kingdom, and send you to the church, for the little person will see God's name. You have seen the night set as a night now, and as you see the night set as a night, you are still again right to be, right to be. I go back to your first time. Revelation chapter 19, verse 5, and it says, saying, out of the throne, saying, Glory to our God, O ye your servants, and ye that fear me, both men and girls, and have heard a sweet word, the bones of a good multitude, and as the bones of many waters, and as the bones of mighty salvation, and a million, for the Lord God in this written throne. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the knowledge of the man is come, and his wife, the bride, has made a shirt ready. The bride has planted that piece of the road in two women, two and wives, for the same men is a righteousness of the saints, and told unto me, righteousness. For the encouragement of the believers, all I see. For the encouragement of those who are suffering, and they are wondering, I'm not suffering like this. What is the purpose of suffering like this? Suffer now for Christ, and then the reign of Christ is coming right to them for them. Those that are doing, which are called unto the Lord's Supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the first things of God. Welcome to our very first account of the Lamb. So the account of the Lamb, students on the side, and he that sat upon the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And it says unto me, John, you have not been so guilty yet, or I should die again. Do you see the commandments of the Lord? When the Lord has given you a revelation, then you want you to publish it. He has given you understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom of God. He has given you to publish it for the encouragement of the believers that now they go to a problem. And for the encouragement of the unbelievers, the sinners that are not born again, so that they will see the glory that are with the believers, and they will want to come into the kingdom of God. It says in that verse, I rise, but these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is true. And 
character in any day, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that has of the fountain of what of the water of life freely. He that is a comet shall be holy to all things. I tell you another thing. Because it is that way that you will see your sudden all this is for encouragement that the journey that is to come, when you are proud, and there are the blessings we are going to receive, the people are encouraging me that whatever we are going through today, so this means nothing, it's just life affliction. Whatever I'm going through, the journey that is to come, that's what I'm waiting for. And it is when we overcome, we'll be able to inherit all things. He that is a comet shall inherit all things. And I will be with God, and he shall be my son. What is the first of the person? This one becomes fearful and timid, and you can't be able to move on with the left, but are fearful and you're unbelieving, and you're burning with it, and you're mortal, and you're mongers, and you're sorcerers, and you're idolaters, and all liars will have their part in the midst with bones of fire and brimstone. The Lord is encouraging us to say that if we're here to the earth, there is reward. If we're here to the earth, we're going to reign with the Lord. The great boy coming as we come for the voice of Christ, the joy of glorified Christ. John had that voice before he saw him. The one who spoke then identified himself as the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last. And in the speaker, who is to reveal and execute the divine plan is the eternal Christ himself as the Alpha and the Omega. All of the works of wisdom and revelation from heaven are in him. Because he is the Alpha. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet. And it's the Omega. That's the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That means then all the letters and all the words in between. It belongs to him. And the revelation of all mysteries from God comes through Jesus Christ. He is the sum total, the embodiment of the words and the wisdom and the self disclosure of the invisible God. Christ is everywhere present in this book, is everywhere prominent in this book. Not only present and prominent, I bet the references to you already is preeminent, is exalted above everyone else, above angels and men, above the living creatures and above the 24 elders, above everyone because you see them throwing down their crowns and then bowing down before him, worshiping him. In this book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is exalted as he is preeminent. This book of Revelation then reveals the exaltation, the power, the dominion, the authority, the enthronement of Christ. Angels and men worship him. They worship the preeminent Christ. And John was commanded right to them, revealing all that we have seen. Send it to the church. When Daniel received his own revelation for the end time event, he was commanded to seal up the book, even to the time of the end. But John was commanded, don't seal it up, don't wrap it up, don't bury it. Write it down. Send this revelation to God's people. The mystery was sealed at the time of Daniel. It is now an open vision in the time of John the Beloved. When the Lord has given you, revealed himself to you in salvation, revealed himself to you in sanctification and holiness, revealed himself to you in the power of the Spirit, you are to then reveal that same truth unto all the people so that what you have seen, what you have enjoyed, all the people too, they will be able to see, they will be able to receive, they will believe and they will enjoy as well. Remember what the Lord has taught us today, I John. You are also your companions and your brothers in tribulation and in the kingdom and in the patience of Jesus Christ. I was in the island, the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. And I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in the book. And send thee unto the churches which are in Asia. The Lord has revealed Himself to you today. Are you just going to go out with us, do something about it? Wouldn't you allow this revelation of the word to have an impact upon your life? So that the commandments of the Lord will be able to carry out as John obeyed the Lord, you too will have the grace to obey the Lord. Let's rise up and begin to pray. Are you in the spirit or in the flesh? During the study, are you in the spirit or in the flesh? When you are going through persecution, do you stay in the flesh or you come into the spirit? Have you been persecuted for your faith? Have you been persecuted for your stand? Have you been persecuted for being saved, for living a righteous life? That to refuse to bow the knee to the kings of this world and to the idols of this world. 
and you refuse to bow the knee for the invitation to the invitation of the people of the world and you are taking your stand or during the persecution and during the problems and during the things that come upon you then you come in the flesh and you are not able to receive the revelation of the Lord I want you to tell the Lord the Lord will give you the grace that during your persecution, during your suffering, during the pain, whatever affliction or whatever may be the trial of faith coming upon your life, you will not be thinking in the flesh, you will not be acting in the flesh, you will not be behaving in the flesh, you will be in the spirit, in the spirit. And during that time of persecution in the spirit, the Lord will be able to reveal himself more and more unto you. John was born again. He had known the Lord. And he bore record to that what it means to be born again, what it means to know the Lord. Are you born again like John was born again? John had been sanctified. The Lord Jesus prayed for John. And the Adamic nature was taken away. He received that purifying of the that sanctification of his spirit. And was fully consecrated and committed to the Lord until the very end of his life. Persecution, yes. Suffering, yes. Pain, yes. Affliction, yes. Opposition of the enemies, yes. He tread upon believers, yes, but he remained through it all, through it all. He remained with the Lord. How about you? How about you? Are you remaining with the Lord? Are you remaining with the Lord? In the midst of the suffering, remain with the Lord. Whatever the suffering, whatever the persecution, remain with the Lord. It's not the persecution, the suffering or the pain. You can still be in the spirit. 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 Pray. The Lord will strengthen you. The Lord will help you.